We can't change our genes, but we can change the expression of our genes with our epigenetic factors. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on a functional nutrition. So how do we navigate our own health and what is best for our own bodies for healing and thriving in life? We also touch on topics like how to identify and address root causes of chronic conditions, how to care for our health as a whole, incorporating nutrition, lifestyle, mindset, and beyond. Our guest today is Andrea Nakayama. As the host of the 15 Minute Matrix podcast and the founder of Functional Nutrition Alliance, Andrea Nakayama is leading thousands of students and practitioners around the globe in a revolution to offer better solutions to the growing chronic illness epidemic. By highlighting the importance of systems biology, root cause methodology, and therapeutic partnerships, she helps historically underserved individuals reclaim ownership of their health. Before we begin, I have something special to share. If you're ready to transform your life in 2025, the Artist of Life Workbook is your ultimate guide. This all-in-one tool is packed with prompts and exercises to help you reflect, set powerful goals, and stay accountable to them, and design a life you truly love. Start your year with clarity and intention. You can find it at shop.lavendaire.com. All right, let's dive into the episode. Hello, Andrea. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? Good. Thank you so much for having me here, Eileen. Thanks for being here. Okay, so let's first talk about your story because you actually have a very tragic, but it's a dramatic story. Tell us what your story is and what led you to pursue functional nutrition full-time. Yeah, so my story that led me to functional nutrition started back in April of 2000 when my late husband was diagnosed with a very aggressive brain tumor, a brain tumor called a glioblastoma multiforme. At the time of his diagnosis in his very early 30s, I was seven weeks pregnant with our first and only child. So we were basically telling people that we had a brain tumor before we were telling people that we were pregnant and expecting. So that really catapulted me into a different lens with my existing passions for food, right? I was already a kind of foodie in the Bay Area, cooking and loving to go to the farmer's markets. But when you're given a grave diagnosis like that, you start to look for all the other things that you might be able to do to be able to support health and potentially longevity. So my late husband, Isamu, was given six months to live. He lived two and a half years. So he was able to, we were able to extend his prognosis. He was able to meet our son. He died when our son was 19 months old. At the time we're recording this, my son is uh, 23 years old. He's in Asia exploring. So, you know, it's a long time ago, but that really catapulted a lot for me in recognizing the gaps in healthcare and also where we can support and fill those gaps. Wow. What a story. And so it started out like, like you needed to learn everything you could about nutrition because of your husband. And then immediately, did you see it as a career or I guess, what was your personal journey through that? Yeah. So I already, like I said, had an interest in like food and nutrition. And I think I was trying to, in retrospect, manage my own autoimmune condition. I have Hashimoto. So I think I was seeing the start of that. It didn't have a name yet. It didn't manifest into what we know as a diagnosis. So I hadn't hit that tipping point, but I was experiencing some symptoms and kind of trying to manage them with food and recognizing what makes me feel more inflamed, what makes me feel less inflamed. And then when he was diagnosed, while he was exploring all the medical treatments, I started to look into 
what are all the other things we can do? What we might call integrative health, right? Where's the acupuncture and the yoga and food? Like, is there anything we can do to support his body and the environment in which the tumor is growing and the environment that is receiving a lot of aggressive treatments, whether that's being cut into or radiation or chemotherapy? How do we support the body and the mind through all that it's going through when it has a diagnosis and it has to go through treatment. So that really became my like, what can we do to support him? Also, what could we do to support my body? I'm growing a baby. How do I support my own body? And then ultimately, how do we support this baby and his health, right? So that was the beginnings of everything. It wasn't until after Isamu passed away in 2002 that I was still kind of doing this thing and at home has become my religion, right? Like this is how I lived my life. I live in Portland, Oregon now. So I'm in a bubble of, you know, everybody has a half cow in the refrigerator and (laughs) urban chickens and shops at the farmer's market. But I was sort of known as the person who brought the healthy, yummy food to potlucks, to school events. And so it wasn't until a friend of mine was diagnosed with colon cancer And that friend is a doctor. And I kept thinking, she's a naturopathic doctor. And I kept thinking, oh, she doesn't need me. This friend group doesn't need me. But she asked me to help her. And I found, wait a minute, this is my calling. This is my purpose. I was working in book publishing. I had a very successful career and worked from home. But it wasn't my calling. And in that, I had to recognize that there was something I had to do to change my life. It was scary. It was a big leap, especially as a single parent with a single income. And I took a huge leap, put myself back through years of school, started a practice, and it grew and grew and grew from there in ways that we may explore today. Yeah. I mean, you've grown your business so big and it's, it's, you're so successful now. So I, first of all, congratulate you for what you've achieved. I think it's amazing hearing that story. So why don't you start by, I guess, explaining to our, our audience, what is functional nutrition or, and is it different from functional medicine? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's important that we establish that. So when it comes to a functional practice, whether it's functional medicine or functional nutrition, there are three primary tenants that ideally make that practice functional. And those three tenants are a therapeutic partnership, looking for the root causes and a systems-based approach. And so for me, as I was starting to do work and coming from a very different background, I found real alignment with the practices of functional medicine. Now, functional medicine is gaining traction today, which is awesome. And yet it's kind of moving away from those three primary tenants. So if I just look at those three primary tenants, a therapeutic partnership means that there is a partnership between the provider and the patient, that they are equal partners in many ways. The provider is not the God, they are the guide. And every patient, you and I as patients, have an expertise that the provider cannot have. We have expertise in ourselves. And we'll talk more about that today, I'm sure, as well. When we look for the root causes, it means we're asking, why is this happening? Not just what do I do about it? And we live in a culture, especially with social media, of I have this pain, I have this ache, I have this diagnosis, what do I do about it? What's the fix? But functional medicine and functional nutrition ask why. Why is this happening and how do I look upstream for what's manifesting downstream. And a systems-based approach means we recognize that the body is an ecosystem. So as we know today, the gut is connected to the brain. We know a lot more about the mind, body, spirit. We can also understand that hormones are connected to the liver and detoxification, which is connected to the gut. So we understand systems biology And then I'm also a real lover of systems thinking, so mental models that help us to consider how we solve complex problems. So those three primary tenets, 
therapeutic partnership, looking for the root causes, and a systems-based approach are what make a practice truly functional. And then when we think about functional medicine and functional nutrition, that just really comes down to the modalities that we use. So in functional medicine, they're still diagnosing and treating. In functional nutrition, we're assessing, recommending, and tracking repeat. We're really working with all the factors that impact uh, growth metabolism and repair in the body at a more day-to-day level. So all the things that you would do on your own versus what you'd go to the doctor for. Okay, got it. So functional medicine is like you're treating something and then functional nutrition is just general well-being, right? With I wouldn't think of it as just well-being. I would think of it as addressing the environment in which the diagnosis exists. So let's say right now I'm working with somebody with severe eczema. Curing his eczema is not my job. Curing the environment in which the eczema is manifesting is how I think about it. So it's not just, let me help you feel good or lose weight. It really is based on chronic conditions, but it's recognizing those chronic conditions exist in an environment. If I think about my late husband's brain tumor, not my job to cure his brain tumor, but that brain tumor exists in an environment and it is my job to say how. Can you describe what the environment means? Like what you mean when you say environment? Yeah, the whole body's ecosystem. So if we look at our hormone issues, we can say, yes, that's the tip of the iceberg. I call it the branch on the tree. But how do we think about food, movement, environment, and mindset, and the ways that those factors influence the expression of that sign, symptom, or diagnosis? So it's very specific to the individual, not only in the recommendations, but also in understanding, does this individual have issues with food from their history, from their culture? What's their relationship with their body, with dietary change? All of those factors become a part of the equation. So instead of just thinking through wellness in general, which is a word I have a bit of a problem with, um, (laughs) we're thinking about this individual, how do they sleep? How do they poop? How is their blood sugar for the environment that's allowing for the expression of that sign, that symptom, or that diagnosis? Let's take a break for our sponsor, Honey Love. Say goodbye to suffering in uncomfortable bras and shapewear. Honeylove has revolutionized the game with their innovative and comfortable designs. Their bras feature supportive bonding that eliminates the need for underwire without sacrificing lift. What I love about Honeylove is how their shapewear makes me feel. The fabric is so soft and the shapewear uses targeted compression to enhance your curves without squeezing them. One thing that stands out is the crossover bra. It supports without underwires and has that elegant mesh detailing that feels and looks great. And for smooth sculpted support, the Superpower Short sculpts and stays in place. No rolling up or down. Treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save up to 60% off site-wide at honeylove.com slash TLL until December 4th only. Inventory is limited and the sale ends soon, so don't miss their best deals of the year. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them, so please support our show and tell them we sent you. Again, it's honeylove.com slash TLL. Elevate your comfort, elevate your style, thanks to Honeylove. It seems like there's so much that you have to look at because like you said, the whole body is a system. Everything's interconnected. Is it difficult for you to tell what causes what? And then I guess, where do you even start, right? (laughs) Yeah. So we're never looking at it as a direct cause and effect. So when we look at those roots, I will say any sign, symptom, or diagnosis that we're talking about, like I said, is a branch. So we can name the signs, symptoms, and diagnoses that we hear people talk about. PMS, endometriosis, migraines, right? All the things we hear people talk about every single day, those are branches. Anything that we can name as a sign, a symptom, or a diagnosis is a branch. When it comes to the roots, anything that's chronic, where which is where functional medicine and functional nutrition do their best work, is where we go deeper to those roots. And in functional nutrition, we look at the soil. So the roots with any chronic condition from my lens are the genes 
digestion, and inflammation. Those are the roots, but each of those roots exist in soil. And then I have that circle of influence around each of those roots. So with your genes, I can't change your genes, but I can influence the expression of your genes. So if we're dealing with something like breast cancer that has a genetic component or Alzheimer's that has a genetic component, it's not my job to say, how do I target the diagnosis. Instead, I'm thinking more broadly about what's leading to that situation. And that gives me a way in. So to answer your question about where we start, we start with a really deep assessment of that individual. So we're getting out of the X for Y, here's the supplement or the protocol for that condition. And we're understanding the person. How are you born? What order, what's your birth order? Where were you born? What's happened through your lifespan? We're really understanding you and that gives us some clues, but we're always starting in certain places that help us to kind of clear the muddy waters. I call it the non-negotiable trifecta, sleep, poop, blood sugar balance. If you're not sleeping, if you're not pooping, your PMS is not going to resolve. Your hormone issues are going to persist. So we keep chasing some fix. And instead, we're thinking more broadly about how to access what might be occurring and seeing what shifts through that process. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So can you repeat? It was like genes, inflammation. What was the third one again? Genes, digestion, and inflammation. So I'll always tell people like, If you're talking about nutrition without talking about digestion, that's not functional because digestion is where food meets your cells, meets your physiology, right? So we have to optimize the body's function. I love that there's just three because it makes it simpler. Oh, that's where you start. (laughs) Always three. I always have threes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So tell us more about understanding our root causes. Cause I think a lot of listeners, they either experience or know people who experience some sort of chronic illness or something autoimmune. So like how we're always focused on the surface level. How do we understand the root cause and identify and address them? Yeah. So I think there are ways that we can slow down and stop seeking. So we end up, and you talk a lot about this in your different conversations in terms of mindset, we end up in a very sympathetic dominant state. That's a fight or flight state when we are looking for what is the cause? What is the root? What's wrong with me that I need to fix myself? And we're looking and searching and we get very stuck in the pill, the protocol, the practitioner. What's going to be the answer? And I really like to take us to that model, that three roots, many branches, and that focus on the soil to say it's going to be broader. It's a lot of things. It's what we call in the industry multifactorial. And when we step back and nurture broader, more broadly, different parts, Parts of ourselves from our mindset to our environment, to our sleep, our poop, our blood sugar, we start to be able to shift the environment. Like I was saying, the terrain that's giving rise to the expression of the symptoms associated with that autoimmune condition. So I have Hashimoto's, like I said, it's knock on wood, completely managed because I'm able to take care of myself and not look for something out, give that agency away to some easy fix. So when we're thinking about autoimmunity, any chronic condition, genes, digestion, inflammation, if we focus just on those three and that's a lot to focus on, that is enough. But that's where I come to my three tiers And that leads us to the non-negotiable trifecta, deficiency to sufficiency, and dismantling the dysfunction. So let's just focus for a moment in the where to start on the non-negotiables, tier one, which is where we can focus while we're looking for help. The non-negotiables are any non-negotiables we can identify for ourselves. So we can ask ourselves, what makes me feel better? What makes me feel worse? And when we know that, 
that gives us some of the nutrients that our body needs. And I don't mean vitamins. I mean like all the other life factors, whether it's self-worth or the things that make us feel great, whether it's cuddles or dance class or joy of some sort or being in nature or touching a tree or eating that breakfast every morning. How do we recognize what are my non-negotiables personally? And then again, my non-negotiable trifecta for you is sleep, poop, and blood sugar balance. So let's focus on one, sleep. What's happening around our sleep? What can we do about our sleep? It's not easy. I can't just say, hey, Eileen, sleep. I have to look at your patterns, at your behavior. And I think when we focus more narrowly in an area that impacts us more broadly, we have more opportunity to influence our health outcomes. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. It's like start from those those basics. What about blood sugar balance? Like, what are your tips for that? Yes, it's a great question. So again, you're probably noting that I speak in threes. It mm-hmm. can feel like speaking in tongues sometimes because I'm taking what's really complex autoimmunity and saying it's much simpler than you think. We don't need to overcomplicate this. So I have three principles when it comes to um, how I think about dietary principles because we get very caught up in, in eating keto or intermittent fasting or autoimmune paleo. My three principles are easy. Principle number one is fat fiber protein at every meal. That's going to help with your blood sugar right there. Fat fiber protein at every meal. If you don't know which fats, which fibers, which proteins, that's where you can spend your time getting some information. You don't have to be researching, do I need to eat this diet or that diet or follow that protocol that my sister or my cousin is on fat fiber protein. I've got articles on the Functional Nutrition Alliance page about each of those. My second principle is eat the rainbow. And right there, if you eat the rainbow rich foods, you're going to get more fiber that helps your fat fiber protein quotient every single meal. And my third principle is know your yes, no, maybe list. So Eileen, if I ask you what foods make you feel great, And do you know of any foods that don't make you feel so good? You probably know some. Yeah. Anything come to mind for you? Oh, like what makes me feel great? Like fruits. (laughs) There you go. Fruits make you feel great. Yeah. What makes me not feel good? Like, hmm. I would say like if I eat too much pasta or something. Yeah. Like anything too heavy or creamy. There you go. Yeah. So knowing those things about yourself and what we start to do is we take back some of the agency around what we're listening to, because there's a lot of noise out there around nutrition. And instead of listening to the noise, we start to listen in and play a little bit. Fat, fiber, protein. What does that mean? What am I eating? I'm eating an apple. What did I get? I got fiber. Where is my fat? Where is my protein? Should I put some nut butter on my apple? Can I eat cheese? Do I put cheese with my apple and eat that? Did you start to think through how do I put these things together? And blood sugar is at the base of our hormone balance. So anything we're experiencing with hormones, if you think fat, fiber, protein, you're actually helping yourself sleep and poop are also going to help your hormones. <laughs> like there's, yeah. it comes, it's so simple and yet we want to come. And then you said that was the basic tier. Non-negotiable trifecta is the, yeah, those are the non-negotiables, tier one. It, can you tell us a little about, about tier two or tier three? So tier two is what I call deficiency to sufficiency. This, from a practitioner perspective, may be a deficiency in a nutrient. So I may look at your labs and see that you're deficient in iron or vitamin D, or with your hormones, you may be deficient in a certain hormone, or you may be toxic, which is the other level, you know, we have deficiency to sufficiency to over sufficiency, right? So there's a spectrum there. And we're always looking to find that balance. And I'm not talking about testing, necessarily, it really can just be in things like joy, sleep, Mm. fun, 
laughter when we think personally about deficiency to sufficiency. What do we love that we're not getting enough of in our lives? And how do we bring that into a little bit more sufficiency? So non-negotiables, and those include what we know for ourselves, as well as the non-negotiable trifecta, deficiency to sufficiency. With each of us, we can start with saying, do I have a deficiency in greens? Or do I have a deficiency in colors? Or do I have a deficiency in sleep? We don't have to think about like vitamin D and iron. Dismantling the dysfunction tier three is where we tend to jump. That's what medicine does. And what I'm saying is that when we focus on tier one and tier two, it's another way in to dismantle the dysfunction as opposed to trying to go for the dysfunction head on. Yep. Let medicine do that, but we don't have to do that. Right, right. That makes sense. Like start with the basics, get the basics right. Okay. So I also love that you bring in this element of something outside of just food and nutrition, right? This element of joy, what makes you happy, things you love. Can you talk more about that and how that influences our health? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an important point. And if you look at all my systems, they include mindset or stress and resilience or community and relationships. And I truly believe that nutrition is about growth, metabolism, and repair. And growth, metabolism, repair go beyond the food that we put in our body. It's really about sleep. It's about relationships. It's about the resilience that we build, which comes from a number of different factors. And things like joy and purpose and passion, these are what are called positive psychological constructs or PPCs. And there's so much research that shows the influence that these PPCs have on our underlying health. So again, I think when we're stuck, when I say sympathetic dominance, state. That's a fight or flight state. Where am I broken? Where do I need to be fixed? What's going on? When we focus on the parasympathetic, that's rest and digest. I am good. I am fine. I have this thing I'm working on. I nourish myself with joy and pleasure and laughter and all the things that help me to be more of myself as opposed to being stuck in this I'm broken mentality that a lot of people who are experiencing chronic health challenges can can get stuck in. Time for another quick break. Today's episode is brought to you by Lola V, the incredible hair care line founded by Jennifer Aniston. As the holidays approach, it's the perfect time to give the gift of beautiful, healthy hair with Lola V. Lola V stands out with their B-Pro3 bond technology derived from chia seeds. This innovative formula is designed to fight hair damage, prevent dryness, and keep your hair vibrant and strong. And for those looking for the ultimate hair care treat, check out their ultimate care kit. It includes the best-selling restorative shampoo, conditioner, and the award-winning glossing detangler, which not only detangles, but also protects from heat and adds a brilliant shine. This holiday season, unlock Jennifer Aniston approved hair at Lola V. Com. As our loyal listeners, you can shop their best sale of the year from now until Cyber Monday and get 25% off your order at lolavie.com. Please note, discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. Let's get a little bit more practical. Like, Are there any actionable steps that you can share today related to functional nutrition that we can start applying for our health? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I think this is really about taking back our agency. And when we're giving it away to social media, to all the recommendations, we lose our agency. So again, just I just want to anchor fat fiber protein is something we can do today. Like just start thinking about every time you eat and tune into how you feel. If you're able to keep what I call a food, mood, and poop journal, that's an actionable step. And when I say mood, I don't just mean our mental health mood. I mean any sign or symptom we're experiencing. So if you can take three days and say, I'm going to track my food, not measure it, just what did I eat or not eat, 
my mood in quotation marks. So how do I feel? How does my body feel? And my poop, and you can get something called a Bristol stool chart and give it a number so you don't have to write details about your poop, but just see what it looks like before you flush. If you can start tracking and looking inward as opposed to looking outward, you become a better agent for yourself. I'm not asking you to diagnose, but you show up to your providers with more information and you start to see, let me play now. I'm going to take one meal. This is how I felt for three days. Does anything change if I eat eggs and toast with avocado one day? Or if I drink a smoothie another day, or if I skip breakfast, do any of the things in the mood category change? So what I'm asking people to do as an actionable step isn't to eat flax seeds or put collagen in their coffee. It's think more broadly, get more playful and track what's happening for you. Because Eileen, what works for you isn't going to be what works for me. This is where we really embrace bio-individuality, and the only way to get there is by tuning in. So my actionable step is going to be, if you're able and it's not triggering in any way, start with a food mood poop journal and see how am I doing? How am I feeling? What symptoms are coming up? And then instead of looking at it all crazy trying to fix everything, you start to play and get a little bit more tactical in each and every step. And again, if we're thinking about what we're eating, three principles, fat, fiber, protein, eat the rainbow and know your yes, no, maybe list and play, start that play, play from there. Yeah. I love how empowering that is to just understand yourself because then you can find your own patterns. Yes. Something you also talk about is how everyone has, you know, we're we're all so different and we react differently to different, I guess, environments or foods. So how can we approach healing ourselves when everybody's so different? (laughs) Yeah. I think this is where the tuning in is really, really critical. If we're basing what we do on our diagnosis, right? They If I just look at Hashimoto's as an example, is there a condition that you hear a lot about in your community that people have? Is it? I guess like migraines or things like that. Yeah. Migraines, PMS, right? I mean, I'm at the age where people are talking like peri and post menopause, right? So anything hormonal related, we get bombarded with a lot of information about what it means and what we should do. And this is where I think that tuning in and really understanding ourselves comes into play. So we can show up for ourselves better, make better and slower decisions. I always like to say, slow it down to speed it up. Sometimes when we're adopting a protocol, we think it's going to speed it up, but it's hard to maintain. And then what I see with people who have a lot of chronic conditions is they get overwhelmed with the restrictions of the dietary protocol. They can't go out. They're taking 50 million supplements. Then there's advertisements for a new supplement that's supposed to happen. Just slow it down and tune in. And I think that's how we know more what's true for us versus what's true for what we're experiencing, which is only an aspect of us. I'm Andrea who has Hashimoto's. My husband was Isamu who had a brain tumor. The biggest gaps I found in medicine when he was diagnosed, because we were catapulted in our 30s into the system of medicine, right? Like we had never been there before when knock on wood, a lot of us don't have to exist inside the system of medicine. But the things that I recognized right away were that everybody with the same diagnosis is treated the same and people are treated like their diagnosis. So I would be my Hashimoto's, his brain tumor. And then everybody with that brain tumor, there is a protocol. And there's a time and a place for that, but not when it comes to our chronic health challenges. So this is the real mental reframe about where our medical system is excellent and advancing at a rapid rate and where I am very much the yes and 
And where we have to say, if you're experiencing something that's just not going away, we need a different approach. And that approach is slower, it's broader, and it's recognizing you're not broken. You are experiencing something, and it may be for different reasons than somebody else. This is similar to the topic of how there's always like a new superfood or diet that's touted as like a best new health approach. And there's so many people have their opinions on what, what's the best way to eat or what the best foods for this or that. So how do we know where to focus our energy when there are so many options out there? Yeah, I think this, again, I'm just going to bring it back to like whole foods. When I talk about fat, fiber, protein, those fats are whole food sources, avocados, eggs, olive oils, right? Really looking at what are the whole food sources, asking ourselves, where did this food come from? What am I eating? What am I putting in my body? Do I know these ingredients? If we start there, we are 95% of the way to where we need to be. I think it's important to look at the commonalities between a lot of these diets as opposed to the differences. Are there times and places where we need to be on a healing diet or a healing protocol? Yes. Those very limited protocols are meant to be done for a short period of time as a therapeutic intervention with somebody who understands that therapeutic intervention. And unfortunately, a lot of people are following very restricted diets for either too long or they're doing them incorrectly. They're introducing new deficiencies that are leading to new signs and symptoms. So I would just say whole foods, fat, fiber, protein, eat the rainbow, know your yes, no, maybe list. And you are 95, 98% of the way. For most people, it might be 100% of the way there. And we don't have to go to these things. So when I look at that root of the genes, there's what we call epigenetic factors. So the epigenetic factors are the factors that influence the expression of our genes. And when I think about our genes, like I said, we can't change our genes, but we can change the expression of our genes with our epigenetic factors. Epigenetics, fancy word, break it down, food, movement, environment, and mindset. If I think about food, I'm thinking about quality, quantity, diversity, and timing. If we take one of those, diversity, go back to eat the rainbow. It's all interconnected. I'm simplifying it, even though it sounds really complex. It's really about getting simpler and slowing down what we're trying to do to help ourselves feel better. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really helpful to hear that it's it, it, like, I know it can be confusing, but you're, you're breaking it down and you're making it simple. Like just focus on these things. <laughs> yes. So Basically, when you are treating someone with a chronic illness, does that mean that a lot of the key dietary or lifestyle changes basically are kind of the same that you recommend to everyone? Or I guess, how do you recommend implementing changes? Yeah. So we have to, again, start slow and recognize what works for any one individual. And some of that is based on the physiological response. So what's happening in the body. If I say to somebody, eat a lot of fiber, fat, fiber, protein, and they have digestive issues, they're not going to do well with that fiber. And so we have to build up the system to be able to benefit from fat, fiber, and protein. I'll just tell a story. When I met my boyfriend over six years ago, when I first met him, he ate chicken, oatmeal, and rice, period. He wouldn't eat anything else. And we would go out and I would get a big salad or a big bowl of greens. And he would be like, I wish I could eat that. And I was like, why can't you eat it? And he started to tell me on a drive one day, I can't eat garlic. I can't eat onions. And I was like, oh, okay. He has FODMAP issues. He can't digest certain foods. So he said, if you can help me eat a bowl of broccoli, you're the queen. I was like, game on. Yeah, you're the one to help. (laughs) You found the right one. (laughs) So just helping him add some things to his foods, to his smoothies that were all 
gut supportive, now he can eat anything he wants, like literally anything, even foods that I wouldn't want him to eat. He but can that's eat. expertise that you have that exactly. I'm, I'm trying to extract something that our regular listeners can can implement in their life. Because I, I know many people don't have the, I guess, funds or resources to see a practitioner. Thousand percent. And I guess what I'm saying is that when you ask me the question of, is there one place, is it the same for everybody? I'm giving an example where fat fiber protein may lead somebody to say, I can't eat that much fiber. And then that's the place to focus why, what do I need to do? Can I go slowly with that? I'm, I'm really inviting people to tune in. If these are the principles, fat, fiber, protein, eat the rainbow, know your yes, no, maybe list. I'm all about the democratization of functional nutrition. This isn't about doing a bunch of testing. It's not about seeing a practitioner, but you have to stay in that place not run to the supplements. You don't need to shop at Whole Foods. Eating the rainbow, how does it feel? Which foods feel good, which don't? Just slow down, stay in the response of your body and know that your body is going to respond different. So fat, fiber, protein, eat the rainbow, know your yes, no, maybe list. That's the commonality. Mm, Beyond that, it's going to manifest differently for everybody in terms of, oh, when I eat meat, first of all, maybe I don't eat meat. Or when I eat meat, I have digestive issues. We have to tune in and ask the questions, when does this happen? What are the circumstances around this? Is this something I can explore right here for myself Mm. versus what's the diet? What's the questions? I'm asking to reframe the questions, right? Yeah, yeah. So much of it, it, I guess to summarize, so much of it is tuning into your own body and you really have to keep a journal because I think we just go about life and we forget our response. We don't even know what caused what. So it's, yeah, it's getting clear and really understanding your body. (laughs) And it's a pain in the butt if you don't have a chronic health issue. So I get that. Like (laughs) functional practices serve those who are struggling. And unfortunately, that's a growing population of people. A lot of people need that. And a lot more young women. And so I just feel like we're going about it all wrong. And if the information was out there and it was one food, one diet, one supplement, one way, we would have the answer because there's so much information available to us. We have Google, we have ChatGBT, we have Instagram influencers who are telling us all the solutions. So yeah, yeah. it's a big reframe about tuning in versus tuning out. And that's why every question you ask me I'm kind of reframing through a different lens. And that's what makes it functional. Yeah, it totally flips it because people are always searching, like you said, on social media, they hear a new a new diet, a new trend, a new healing food or whatever. And then they they go into that program trying to heal. But it's it's like you have to create your own customized program for yourself because everybody is different. Yes. And I can see in you the light bulb going like, Mm. oh, wait, this is a reframe, (laughs) right? right? So, and that's hard. I just want to acknowledge that that's hard for us to do. We live in a culture that tells us that there is a quick fix, that we are broken. And I just want to invite people to say like, it's not that complicated. It's you. Like nourish (laughs) yourself, just spend time with yourself. And when you do that, healing starts to happen in a whole new way because we've shifted our focus from the outside to the inside. All right, let's take another break for our sponsor, Branch Basics. This holiday season, let's transform our cleaning routine with Branch Basics. I've recently switched to their starter kits, and it's not just about cleaning, it's about creating a healthier living environment. Made from plant and mineral-based ingredients, it's safe for every room and everyone in my home. What I adore about Branch Basics is the simplicity and versatility of their concentrate. It handles everything from stubborn stains to daily dirt without exposing us to harmful chemicals. I also really appreciate their refill model. One concentrate equals up to 13 refills, making it both economical and eco-friendly. 
Get yourself and your loved ones the best gift of all, the gift of Clean with Branch Basics. For a limited time only, our listeners get 15% off and free shipping on their premium starter pack when you use the code TLL at branchbasics.com forward slash TLL. That's 15% off your order at branchbasics.com forward slash TLL with promo code TLL. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Get Branch Basics this holiday season because cleanliness matters. Something else that I want to touch on is like motivation and purpose and how that is related to health, right? Like if you don't have motivation or purpose in your life, your health actually diminishes. So what advice do you have for people related to that? I'm a systems thinker. So I'm going to bring you into my uh, five P's that I like to think of. And I think that when we're considering purpose, if we start with our passions, that's the easy place in because purpose can be really overwhelming. Like I said, I have a 23 year old, right? So I know that like finding our life purpose doesn't necessarily come to us. It can be rough. Just starting with your passions. So I'm going to give you the five Ps and then we'll look at them. But this again relates to those positive psychological constructs that nourish us. They become part of how we um, find health and healing. So passion, permission, purpose, persistence, and perseverance. So if we know our passions, what lights you up? Like, what are the things that light you up? Conversations about interesting topics that bring us deeper into ourselves, whatever it is that lights you up. I used to dance. I started dancing again. I am so happy. I will go to a dance class every single day that I can. And that gives me something that addresses those deficiencies that I was having, just joy and pleasure and a kind of movement that I wasn't experiencing no matter what I was doing because I wasn't working that hard aerobically, right? So passion is where to start. And I think this is another place we can track for ourselves. Where do I light up? What lights me up in the day, in my week? Where do I feel like I'm in my flow? What's that thing? Then we have to give ourselves permission, which is a hard thing, especially for women, to focus more on what we're passionate about. How do I give myself permission? And this is something for, you know, all the students that I teach, like give yourself permission to make this your career, to do this work. It's okay to give yourself permission to thrive. I was talking to a colleague yesterday and she was talking about the difference between surviving and thriving and how she's ready at this stage in her life to give herself permission to thrive, not just survive. So passion, permission, I think that then leads us to our purpose. This is, of course, what we all know is our big why. And when we're living into our personal why, not our parents why or our spouses why but our own why in the world we start to have a different intention for what we will do so i just want to talk a little bit about purpose and going back to our original conversation with my husband's illness so he was given a grave diagnosis and he was given a prognosis of 6 months to live he was about to be a father for the first time and really wanted to be a father. Making dietary change was no big deal. Not a big deal. There wasn't a like, oh, but I don't want to, because the purpose behind that change was big. The things I've had to do to grow my business were things that I did more easily because of that purpose. I got out of my own way because it wasn't about me. It's about something bigger than me. And that bigger than me is going to help me to learn marketing, to learn sales, to learn growth, to learn business that I don't want to do. It's I'm a nutritionist, (laughs) but I'll do it, right? Because it's bigger. So I think purpose is something we can work into. Yeah, it fuels you. Yeah, Yeah. and it fuels you and your health. And then you can continue on. There was still 
uh, persistence and perseverance. <laughs> yes. So persistence for me is the regularity with which we show up for something. So like me going to my dance class regularly, if somebody's building a business or starting a practice of meditation, it doesn't have to be an hour every day. It could be five minutes every day or five minutes every other day. What are we committing to that is at a digestible rate in that persistence that we can then build upon what we're learning? And the perseverance is recognizing that we're going to fall down but we just get back up. It's not about perfection. It's not about doing it right or not doing it at all. I think there's just a lot of pressure these days of what it means to take on a new practice, make change. We go really big or not at all. And I just want to invite people into a gentler way to find their way forward, no matter what it is that they're pursuing. And that's how we nurture ourselves, put less pressure in ourselves. And therefore we're more self-compassionate, you know, all the things that you talk about on your podcast that allow us to really come into our full expression of self. Yeah, I, I love that. The five Ps are so good. And it kind of brings another question to mind is, can you share your lifestyle or weekly routine, e either daily or weekly, whatever gives us a better picture? But you know, for someone who understands nutrition and health at a deep level as you, how do you live your life? Yeah, I mean, those non-negotiables and knowing my non-negotiables are really important to me. So like sleep is a cornerstone. I didn't sleep so well last night oh. <laughs> because I missed my window, but like sleep is so important. Do you sleep at the same time every day? Is it like Yes, I try to go to sleep and, you know, be in bed, relaxing by 9.30, 10 p.m. bedtime. So, you know, for a lot of people's lifestyle, depending on age and a lot of other factors, it's just making sure at different stages of life that we honor sleep and recognize what might be disrupting it. But I know that I have a harder time with my energy, my hormones, my uh, mood, if I'm not honoring my 9.30, 10 p.m. bedtime. So knowing my non-negotiables, but I also really bookend my day with practices that are nourishing to me where I'm unplugging from other things. So I have a very dedicated morning routine when I travel, I get off that. This is the pa the persistence, right? Like, Yeah. What is the routine though? So I wake up usually at five. I brush my teeth, stretch, do some weight bearing exercises, feed the cat, uh, put the kettle on, take a shower, short meditation. I pull a tarot card just to set an mm -hmm. intention for the day. And then I come, I talk to my boyfriend on the phone and make my morning beverage, which usually has some fat fiber protein, you know, like a matcha green tea with some collagen and some, I like cacao butter in mine. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize fat fiber protein relates to beverages as well. <laughs> everything. So it's the first food I'm putting in, right? So that's my personal morning routine. And all of those things are really short. Yeah. Yeah. It's very doable. Very doable. I'm literally meditating and doing kind of a gratitude. I run through gratitude for my body and my health and my son and my business. Like I just kind of run through my family, friends, coworkers, the world. Like I just run through a little mantra that allows me to sit in gratitude and literally five minutes. Love it. And then evening, what's your evening routine? Yeah, my evening is a little bit more kind of unplugging, reading or listening to a podcast that really um, after dance. So I'm doing my dance class at, in the evening, but then uh, showering and just really taking time to unplug, but engage with things that stimulate my mind in ways that I find broadening and really fulfilling. So, you know, for some people that might be Netflix or whatever it is, but like 
for me, it's a, usually a book or a podcast that um, makes me curious. I love curiosity and that's what feeds me. Love it. And then what type of dance class are you taking? <laughs> so I've been doing I like a little bit too. of hip hop. Oh, fun. But I also, the class I, like I love, studio? it is at a studio. Yeah. Fun, yeah. fun. And it's choreography. And then there's a class I love in Portland that's just so inclusive and delightful. And it's kind of a mix between, I would say, funk, hip hop, and burlesque a little bit. It's just it's packed. It's so much fun. I love that. And I love that you make the time to do these things that bring you joy while running like a successful business and being like doing all that you do, right? I think I have to. And I think that's really what I recognized that if I didn't carve out that time for myself, I was not as good in my role, that it's almost like it serves me to be a better leader, a better teacher, a better creator when I take that time. Love it. All right. So do you have any future projects or initiatives that you're most excited about? Like what's next for you? I feel like I'm uh, definitely getting your gears going and like questions like, what is this that she's talking about? To confuse that even more, I'm studying narrative medicine and the connections between narrative medicine and functional medicine, which for me are really about the patient's story. How do we come more into our stories through practices that have nothing to do with health? I've never even heard of that term, narrative medicine. I know. <laughs> it's like newer than functional medicine. But you're talking about someone's life story and their experiences, how it shapes their health. Yes. And even leaning into the humanities and like looking at art or reading a poem as ways to touch ourselves and learn more about ourselves internally, look in for what, what moves us as opposed to, oh, here's what made me sick. Here's what, you know, as opposed to focusing on that, that there's other ways to uncover our narrative that help us listen in to ourselves. Yeah. So on my new personal website, that's where I'm exploring more of that connection. And that work is very geared towards the patient versus the practitioner. Um, and you know, it's for a more advanced patient who's been there and done that, but it's, it's really lovely practices and I have workshops and writing and working towards, uh, publishing a book. Amazing. No, that sounds so interesting. And to you, do you label, or do you also consider this like holistic health or holistic healing? Cause that's also something that people talk about. Cause I know you, sometimes people separate, like, you know what I mean? They make a distinction. Yeah. So to me, holistic is a umbrella term that is about how we practice or how we look at things. I think a lot of times when we're thinking about holistic, it's the modality, like this is a holistic solution. And I like to think of holistic, how I look at you holistically as the whole person, your history. Right. Your so holistic is an umbrella. Everything. Exactly. And then functional and integrative are two modalities that were born in the 1990s. Is it still under that umbrella though? Yeah, I would say it's under that umbrella. Integrative just means you embrace different modalities. Acupuncture, it's all included. And functional just means we look through a, those three lenses that I talked about, the partnership, the roots, and the- Got it, um, yeah. got it. No, I think it's so exciting just to hear how there's more- more knowledge and expertise in health beyond just like the medical, right? Beyond just the physical. Like there's all the other layers. Your the purpose, joy, your story. Yes, exactly. And I think it it can be hard for us to think of nutrition through that lens, which I feel like is the journey of our conversation that we want nutrition to be about kale and quinoa and you know mushroom coffee, but it's that and some is what I'm saying. Like it can be so much more. 
Yeah, I would say like the light bulb from this conversation in regards to nutrition would be like, traditionally, I would think, oh, you you eat this list of foods that are healthy. Like, you know, eat the rainbow could be like, oh, I have to eat blueberries. I have to eat broccoli. I have to eat. But no, you're saying like out of the rainbow, you can pick whichever foods bring you joy and yes. make you feel best. <laughs> yes. And it's still healthy, but it's for you. Like there's a, you have a response to these foods. It's not just eat the mushroom because they told you to eat the mushroom. Exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Got absolutely. it. Got it. I got it. I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So final question is, if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice or wisdom uh, about functional nutrition or health, what would that be? Yeah, I would just say tune in be with yourself, sit with yourself. That is where the gold is. Um, And I make it an invitation to everybody to sit at the end of your day today, if you've listened this far, and say, how did I feel today? What did I feel today? What brought me joy today? And consider if you want to track that for yourself, if that feels comfortable. Love it. All right. Lastly, where can we find you online? So if you head over to andreanakiyama.com, that will lead you to all the places. So andreanakiyama.com is my current writing, the narrative medicine workshop offerings, which are really fun and they're free. And that'll also lead you back to my work at the Functional Nutrition Alliance, which is the company I founded and where I've trained thousands of uh, practitioners of all sorts in the science and art of functional nutrition. Amazing. And we'll make sure to have all your links down below for those who want to learn more. Thank you so much, Andrea. This was an amazing conversation. Thanks for sharing your knowledge because I I truly did learn a lot today. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much, Eileen. I appreciate your willingness to work through (laughs) the the, um, trajectory there. Yeah. Thank you so much. 